Sounds good. We have about 20 people joining us today. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Jeff. Hi, John. Hi, Joy. Hi, Rebecca. Nice to see everyone. Hi, John. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we have about 20 people joining us today, but, but um, I wanna keep us all on time. So we have enough time for our special guest today, Dr. Vivanti. We're very, very honored to have him from Pennsylvania today, uh, all the way from the East Coast from Drexel University. A few things I'm just gonna go over really quick. Um, our Zoom roles, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. We recommend speaker view for the presentation. Sharing your video is, of course, optional, but we love seeing your faces if you would like to uh, share your video today. And please put all your questions and comments into the chat. Um, we'll have time at the end for question and answer with Dr. Vivanti. I'm sure many of you will have questions. A quick update from Autism Tree. So we have officially now reached over 300,000 people through our social media since March, since the end of March, since um, shelter in place and COVID went into effect. Um, that's a huge milestone for us. Our posts have now been shared over 500 times, 502 times actually, from our social media posts. That's also another huge milestone for Autism Tree. We now have almost 200 videos on our YouTube channel. So if you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please subscribe. We post almost daily um, videos and tips for um, our kids and families who are at home during shelter in place. Um, they're incredibly helpful for all of our families that we serve. And we've posted 137 of those videos since March 12th. So I can't believe it's on July, mid-July mid almost, and then it's going to be August soon. Um, we've also um, had a great success with our Reading with ATPF series. We've had 33 videos that we've posted, and it's almost reached 30,000 people. Um, if you want to read a little kid's book, for our reading with autism tree series, we would love it. And you can talk to me and Rebecca about that. And we've also provided 77 virtual program workshops um, to date since the end of March. And we have 17 more coming up between now and the end of July. We now offer 17 of our 20 programs virtually. And one of our programs, our Bridge to the Beach program is happening right now this week. We have our Bridge to the Beach summer camp, our sixth annual, um, happening in Mission Bay and Mission Beach with the Sandy, city of San Diego with the guards and the junior guards. And um, it's just wonderful. It's our first in-person event that we've been able to offer since March. Um, the kids are wearing masks. They're all social distanced. Um, and, and everything was broken up into time shifts, so there's only six kids at a time. But it's you know, a good trial run for us looking at the future and what that would look like to be able to offer in-person programs for our kids and families that we serve. So all that being said, I'm gonna pass it over to our volunteer executive director and founder, Dana Hoff. And um, she is going to be introducing our special guest speaker today, Dr. Vivanti from Drexel University, Pennsylvania. Hi, TPF family. I'm so happy to see everybody and, and just celebrate these huge milestones. Um, what a gift that we've, you know, impacted over 300,000 people. It was a huge goal and we've, you know, we did it. It's just incredible and shared over 500 times. I mean, pre-COVID, um, we weren't doing any of this. We weren't Zooming together. We weren't seeing our friends on the East Coast. We weren't having so many families be so grateful um, to be able to do virtual um, events to connect and grow um, socially. So I mean, there's just so many um, positives. And right now, with the world stretching us beyond um, our imaginations, um, you know, I just get, I don't know how to stop the things coming through on my phone. It's crazy. I know it's, you're all probably getting it one way or another. Um, for me, my phone's always sending these updates and just said, for the first time since World War II, they're canceling the Rose Bowl parade. And so it just kind of knocks you out. It's like, you know, this is such a historical, undefined time. And um, 
<clears throat> I'm just really proud of everybody and I'll keep saying that. And for Dr. Ravanti, I, I was trying to tell him a little bit on our pre-call that um, I feel that every week we've gone a little bit deeper, you know, and we're growing together and we're also now really seriously needing even more connection, if that's possible, than we've been wanting in the past month. And um, as things go on, I'm sure more people will continue to have a lot of loss in their life, whether it's their job, their children not going to school, you know, family members. It's just, um, it's kind of like a TKO. I mean, that's what I'm honestly feeling a little bit. You know, I have Todd's mother's car in my driveway. I'm driving her car. There's just so many things that are reminders of how the way things used to be. And we really don't know how things are gonna be. And my intention is not to be at all depressing. My intention is to be real <laughs> and to not make light of it. And to just say that I love that somehow organically we started this format that was me wanting to introduce the speakers just naturally more as a family member. And then in doing so, it kind of led to this introduction that I do and so everything, these slides that are going to be coming up, all were in reflection of how and when I met Dr. Vivante, which is when I was on the East Coast these past two years in Pennsylvania. And um, so with that, I think I'm going to start the first slide. Did you know the heart sends more information to the brain than vice versa? I really, I, I know that because I, everything I do is heart, my heart is what guides me but it wasn't always that way. That's not how I was when I had a corporate job in corporate America. Um, it's only something I migrated to running Autism Tree, but that is essentially how our, me and the team at Autism Tree who runs it daily absolutely makes our decisions minute by minute is it's heart centered. We listen to the heart and then we use our brain. And when we do that, um, we find that we are the best version of ourselves. Our heart has a mini brain in it. It has like 40,000 neurocytes, if I'm getting the word wrong, I apologize. But something I've been really looking at this week is that the heart has an actual mini brain and it takes in all the sensory and information around us. And then the brain can, can listen to that part of our heart. But we have to work on it, just like a muscle, just like anything. And even, you know, even in the best scenarios, we're human and we're not always gonna be able to do that. And we can go to the next slide. What is your heart trying to tell your brain? What does your heart want? Whether this makes sense or not right now, I'll tell you what my heart wants. For me, and if you guys would type in something, I love it because it makes our lunch and learn so much more interactive. I get to not just see your face, but hear your voice, hear your thoughts. I always welcome that. I love that we're all different, that we all have 20, 724 trillion cells makes everything about us possible. It makes everything about us different and unique. And well, I love that. I love that to come out. Mine is breathe in calm and breathe out peace. Because I really, really feel that. I feel like my cells want to want to feel more calm. That's what they want. And they want more peace, <laughs> um, period. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys all have to share. Um, and this is a, is a less than one minute on things that I, I feel like really kind of just give you a snapshot um, of what I'm talking about, of the heart and brain connection and how important it is that we keep learning from both, working to having more harmony with our heart and brain. Are we going to show the video? <laughs> Sharing the video now. Okay. We should care about how the heart and brain communicate and the fact that the heart sends more information to the brain than the other way around because the quality of the signals that the heart sends upstairs to our brain have profound effects on how well our brain works. When the, the signals are incoherent, as we call it, that literally inhibits what we call cortical function. It's why when we're emotionally upset, we make poor choices and often end up doing things that we regret later. Like, oh my God, where was my brain? I can't believe I said that or did that. 
which can harm our relationships and certainly our health. On the other hand, when we're able to be in a heart coherent state, the quality of the signals sent to the brain have a big influence on improving cognitive function. We make better choices. We have more clarity right in the moment that we especially need it. I'm going to pull up the quote I picked out today, and it's an honor of our speaker today, Dr. Vivante. Only when your clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony, we can achieve our true potential. You can remove that slide, Rebecca. I want to say something about Dr. Vivante and why I chose this slide for you is this is a little bit of background. So Todd took a job um, in Pennsylvania and um, I had never even been to Pennsylvania. So, you know, I've just said, okay, every day I'm just going to take it one day at a time and do my best, but also want to um, make autism tree grow on the East Coast and learn what was going on there. So, um, every day since the first day I was there on TV constantly, um, the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles, Jeffrey Lurie, has put his heartbeat into raising money for autism um, by igniting through the Philadelphia Eagles Association, and they are a very loved football team um, in Pennsylvania or in Philadelphia. And so it's just literally everywhere on TV, and everyone's very aware of the, of the program and how they're raising money. And um, I wasn't quite sure where the money was going to, and, and so organically, I heard they were doing um, a telethon and I turned it on and there was Dr. Vivanti who's here today. And it was such a um, gift because he clearly is getting funding from, the, from there and was talking about diagnosing children at 36 months of age. So I wrote down his name and I'm like, this is it. He, he wants to diagnose children early, just like we're doing. We've screened over 20,000 kids. This is awesome. We need to meet. And, um, so I got his phone number, I called him, and when we spoke, it was just like, you know, divine intervention. I was so excited to meet him. I told him about the screenings we do in early intervention on the West Coast. I'd like to see what they're doing. And so um, I go and meet with him at uh, Drexel University, and um, one of the first things he told me was his story about his family and how he has twin brothers, um, which I knew none of this, um, that were um, 30 years old and live in a group home now in Tuscany. But when they were diagnosed way back then, they blamed his mother who herself was a doctor. And it, I, I had heard of, of this, but I had never had a personal story. And um, when my son was diagnosed, I was always really deeply, obviously um, speechless that on top of a diagnosis for your child that they would blame the mother. And uh, so that was, that was just um, unbelievable to me. I still hope I meet um, your family in Italy one day, Dr. Vivanti, though it's gotten extraordinarily more difficult to imagine getting out of the country now. But um, that was just astounding to me. That was our first meeting. And then we went to the Brain Foundation dinner, um, me and Todd and Garrett, and sat with Dr. Vivanti with the autism group from Drexel at this Brain Foundation dinner, which was at about two to 300 people from all over that were in town. They were recognizing um, Jeffrey Lurie and some other um, known people that you know, like Mitt Romney's wife, for the work that they've done um, with the brain. I think Mitt Romney's was MS and Jeffrey Lurie's was his work with autism. And they, their, their doctors talked about them and the work they're doing. And it was, it was so well done. But what really stuck with me is I didn't know why Jeffrey Lurie cared so much about autism. And he talked about, this is the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles, having a brother get diagnosed with autism when he, when he was six years old, and that there wasn't even one day that he hadn't thought about autism in his life. And that he would give up winning Super Bowls with the Philadelphia Eagles if um, he could change the lives of everyone around him with autism. And you know, it was a room full of like diehard Philadelphia Eagle fans. And I was, I was just blown away thinking, wow, you know, here I'm with Dr. Vivanti. This is when I'm in Philadelphia. Garrett came, took the train from DC. And we, 
we as a family were so blown away that night on so many levels. Um, but our whole origin and catalyst for how we were there that night was Dr. Vivanti. And next to me was Venus um, David, who's the CEO of an autistic preschool, and you are going to meet her in the future. So it was just a, um, I don't even know what you call that night, but it was a huge catalyst. And then um, the other times, and these pictures kind of capture um, all the different meetings that we've had in the last two years. And so um, when we did a tour, Garrett and I did a tour of the facility, so then Garrett got to really see what Dr. Monty did. Then um, we did Joel's tour out on the East Coast. And Dr. Vez, who's best friends with Dr. Michael Levy, is a neurosurgeon on the East Coast. Dr. Mike Levy, if you don't know him, is a father. He has a son with autism. They're all very involved in helping us start Autism Tree out here in San Diego, California. His best friend is a neurosurgeon um, in Philadelphia. So he hosted a party that Joel Anderson was at. And I got to meet Dr. Vivanti's beautiful wife, who was then pregnant with their first child, Luna. And I really didn't know. Um, for quite a while that his wife, his beautiful wife is from Australia, has a sibling with autism. And it goes deeper. She's an autism researcher at Penn University. So in 16 years, <laughs> um, my heartbeat in introducing Dr. Vivanti, yes, he's a brilliant doctor and you're gonna see some of his work, but He's a family member to me and that he is, him and his wife have not only dedicated themselves because of their siblings, um, they have done more work, Dr. Vivanti, than anyone I've ever met in my life with helping families, helping other siblings on a global scale. I don't even know how many countries Dr. Vivanti has been to. I don't even know if he knows that because he started at such a young age. Um, and that's a whole nother story he might share today or not, but it was such a um, blessing to have him come out for our neuroscience conference. And if you didn't get the opportunity to meet them, him then, you are now. And it's just with um, huge gratitude, uh, Dr. Vivanti, I, that you're here today and for connecting me to so many um, amazing people and um, things that you're doing on the East Coast. And um, thanks for having such a huge heart for our children and families. Thank you so much, Diana. This is, um, it's a tremendous privilege and it's both an opportunity for me to reconnect with the friends and, and, and family of the Autism Tree Project Foundation, but also to, to connect in these times is a very different feeling than an ordinary you know, meeting or, or Zoom meeting. This is about the feeling that you're not, you know, fighting alone in this, in this reality that requires so much adaptation, so much reconsidering everything, including what is the best way to communicate or to even do science or to even do research and to work with the things that we did, we were doing all the time for our early intervention programs, for example, you know, we used to tickle children, we used to teach them how to share toys, we used to teach them things that now we need to teach them not to do. Uh, and so all of this creates stress, it creates frustration, and so I really appreciated the way you started this meeting is about let's reframe this this situation let's see things from a different angle and let's explore and 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 let's um connect with our positive emotions that come from reconsidering things from a different angle so what i will do uh today and i also i'm also happy to see the some of the beautiful faces that i met when i was in san diego at the neuroscience conference because i was sharing with dana that was the last time i got you actually um, go to a new place and meet new people um, seeing because my, my daughter was born soon after and, and, and the lockdown started. So that's another reason why that moment is particularly dear to your heart, to my heart. Um, I am going to share with you a little bit of what we are trying to do uh, in the current situation to to give some 
advice and some tips um, to parents who are home with their kids. Um, and if you have a kid who has autism, obviously, you want to think about this lockdown situation, not just in terms of a challenge, and I do acknowledge it is a challenge, it will be a challenge, because you probably will not have access to resources that you previously had. But it's not only challenges, it's also opportunities. And this is what we were trying to do these days to explore as much as possible. What is it that we can do now that we couldn't do before? So I'm gonna share my slides now. And I will um, go over this, but I want this to be a, an informal conversation, not um, a, a lecture. So I'll, I'll just share with you my, my, my thought around this. So first of all, I will also like to say uh, thank you on behalf of the Drexel Autism Institute. We are in Philadelphia. Uh, we are a group of researchers and clinicians who are devoted to create new knowledge on autism that can benefit children uh, and adults on the spectrum now. We're trying to do research that can affect policy and we are deeply uh, engaged with the, with the community here in Philadelphia. Uh, these are my brothers, Dana talks, talked about them. The reason why I show this slide is because when they were diagnosed with autism in my country, in Italy, uh, in the late 80s, uh, not only there was not a knowledge of, of what caused autism, the idea was that autism was caused by bad parents who were rejecting emotionally their children. But as a consequence of this lack of scientific knowledge on the causes of autism, there was also a lack of services and intervention. And my brothers missed on the opportunity to receive high quality intervention or any kind of intervention, um, really. And now we recognize that this was a human rights violation. Uh, this that I am citing here is an article from the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that is relevant to autism, but to all special needs uh, children. And according to this United Nations document, um, the countries that, that sign and, and this convention, which include the United States, are supposed to provide services, including early identification and intervention as appropriate and services designed to minimize and prevent further disabilities. So when we are not implementing early identification and early intervention programs, we are indeed violating human rights. That's why the work uh, that you guys are doing on, on trying to, to, to make the age of diagnosis you know, earlier and earlier is so important, but it's also a reminder that this is what uh, we, we are meant to do if we don't want to, to violate human rights. So how do we do this uh, with very young children with autism now that we cannot offer services? So the main idea when I'm thinking about early intervention for young children with autism is that the best way for them to teach new skills is through play. Um, play is the most important activity for learning new skills during early childhood. And it's very important to understand that children with autism, just like children without autism, they do enjoy play activities. The idea of a child with autism being unemotional and not interested in doing playful things is absolutely wrong. Uh, children with autism, can uh, play and what happens uh, if they are engaged in high quality play activities is that they will learn new words, new skills, new ways to connect with others. So play is very important. The barrier is that often children with autism uh, engage in play activities in a way that is slightly more object oriented. So they might be 
particularly focused on some specific objects or particularly interested in repeating certain uh, actions multiple times. Or their play can be more brief or let's say unfocused, like moving from one um, object to the other. And that will make it, make it difficult for uh, adults to join in and provide learning opportunities when, when, uh, when you have play that is more object oriented, more repetitive or more brief. But we can address these challenges and, and promote positive play uh, experiences that are also enjoyable by following some strategies. And those strategies come from scientific research that um, myself and other colleagues in this area of research has conducted in the past few years. So I'm gonna share five strategies that we use with, with our children and that I've been sharing with the families I work with um, who are at home with their children. Uh, first of all, when you are playing with a child with autism and you want to ask yourself, is this activity going to be teaching something to the child? Is the child going to get something from this experience? Uh, I will ask myself three questions. The first one is, is this activity a shared activity? Are we doing this together? As opposed to me telling the child what to do or the child doing something that could do uh, in the exact same way without me. You wanna make sure the child is playing with you, not just for you, doing things with you and not just playing with an object. You need to be part of the activity. Second question I ask myself, is this activity, is this play activity meaningful? Meaning the child knows what to do with the play materials and what to expect from the game. It's not sufficient to put the child in front of a toy and expect them to enjoy it if they don't know what to do with that toy. Uh, and most importantly, is this activity rewarding? Meaning is the child experiencing, experiencing pleasure during the play activity? Uh, this is very important because some children might know how to engage with a particular play material, uh, but they might not find it interesting or rewarding, or they might not enjoy doing it. A child can learn how to, to do a puzzle without feeling any particular uh, excitement for the activity. So if I have, if I see that my activity is not a shared activity, or it's not a meaningful activity for the child, or it's not rewarding, I need to change something and create play activities that, that, that tick those three boxes of shared, meaningful, and rewarding. How do we do that? Um, the first tip that I'll share with you is you need to let the child know that the game is more fun if you are part of it. So sometimes if the child with autism is not engaging with you, it's because they're paying attention to something else. They pay attention to other things, for example, the, the, the visual or, or tactile properties of objects. Um, or because their experience is that when the, child, when the adult is trying to play with them, uh, what the adult is doing is to interfere uh, with their goals. So for example, I'm playing with something in a certain way and the adult is telling me, oh, this is not how you play with that toy. You have to play in a different way. And that creates um, a negative experience of doing things with others that might lead uh, children with autism to prefer solitary um, experiences as opposed to shared experiences because their previous history is that someone is telling them what to do and telling them what to do in a way that is, is less fun than what they will do. So where do we start? Um, my first tip is to take center stage make something that gets the child's attention in a positive way. And you can do that by imitating and expanding on the child's actions and using your body movement, uh, facial expressions and tone of voice to make your action more fun uh, and, and playful. For example, if the child is playing with any object like, like this one, this is a little book uh, that belongs to my daughter. And the child is doing something like this. And what I would never do is to take the object from their hand. I rather have a duplicate of the same object. So you're not taking anything from, from the child's hand. And do the same thing that the child is doing. 
but you're doing it in a way that gets their attention. You add some fun to it. For example, you can put the object after you, know, you do this, the child is now noticing you, and then you're doing something like putting the, the object on a slide like this, woo, or putting it on top of your head, and you're pretending to sneeze like this, it's choo, and the object goes down. Something is happening that doesn't interfere with their goal because you're not taking the objects from them. But it has to do with what they're doing. You didn't, you, you don't show something completely different. But it's kind of, um, you, it, it's something that makes a big effect to get their attention. And then you're showing something else that you can do with this. And now if you're both now putting objects on a slide, now you have a starting point to teach something like turn taking, like bam, 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 imitating the same action. And from this to turning pages on the book and then to point on what's in the book. Basically you start from where the child is and then you become part of the activity by adding something valuable to the activity that is fun for the child to, to observe. Um, back to my slides, another important uh, thing when you do this kind of thing is to minimize distractions. Um, so, because that's another reason why uh, a child with autism might not pay attention to you when you try to um, play with them is that there's other, too many other things that capture their attention, the TV uh, or objects unrelated to the activity that compete uh, with you in a sense. So you have to win the competition with other objects. Um, I see it even with my, my very, young uh, daughter who is an infant, it's every time I, I, I take my phone to take, a, to take a picture, she will pay attention to the phone. She will not pay attention to me anymore. So I need to, uh, to make sure that I am the most interesting source of, um, of interest for the child. Um, it's also helpful to alternate routines that involve objects and routines without objects. Those are face-to-face -face routines for very young kids with autism or young kids in general that makes it easy to obtain face-to-face -face engagement, positive engagement, like lab games, like row, row your boat, physical play, like tickling, spinning, going up, 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 down, 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 down. Uh, songs that have actions like the wheels on the bus or finger play games like open shut or creepy fingers and floor songs like ring around the rosy things that get the child to be face to face with you and pay attention to your actions to your mouth movements to the words that uh, that that come from your mouth so the, at this point they are focusing on you you being the source of learning new actions, new words, new things that they can do. Now, my second tip is to repeat the action that the child enjoyed after she communicates that they want the game to continue. So if we, going back to the example uh, before, once you are the center of the child's attention, you put a smile on their face because you're doing these silly, playful actions uh, like the book on your, on your head or, or the book going down a slide, you repeat the action a few times, and then you pose, looking expectantly to your child, position your hands and, and, and body ready to go, and wait for your child to signal that he or she wants to continue. So you do a few times this, ah, ha, 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 choo And then the next time you have your object on your head or up on a slide, but you just wait. You wait for anything from the child, any communication, that signal that they want to continue the activity through their eye contact, sounds, words, or reaching movements. And then when they do that, you go back again. And repeating an action that the child enjoyed after they communicate that they want more really gives this strong reward for the child's communication, it teaches them how to communicate. Teach, it will teach them the power of communication. Oh, I can make that happen. Uh, and it's fun when I communicate with the adult to continue the game. Um, so this strategic posing is particularly fun when the child is really into, you know, what is the, the, the action that is going to come next. Like if you're doing Ring Around the Rosie, you pose before 
we all fall and you wait after a few times, especially if the child finds it very fun when you, when you go down, when you say we all fall down. Um, now that the child knows that the activity is fun because of the actions and words that you have added to the game, you want to encourage the child not only to look at what you're doing, but also to imitate the action you have shown and take turns. So you no longer just providing entertainment to the child by putting the object on top of a slide or, or on your head or whatever silly and playful action that gets their attention. You expect them to do the same. Um, and so you encourage the child to take turn. Now it's your turn with doing pump, pump, pump. You do it. And it, it's important to keep it playful. You are asking the child to do something. You're encouraging the child to do something. But you're still asking them with a playful tone of voice like, your turn, you do it. And doing things together creates connectedness, opportunities to learn and predictability. And predictability is very important and this uh, takes me to the fourth tip. Uh, and then I'll show you some videos, which is creating a predictable structure. And that goes back to uh, what I told you before about activities being meaningful. Activities are meaningful when the child knows what is going to happen next, they know what to expect. Uh, and so there are different ways to do that. One is arranging objects around so that uh, the child makes sense of what to do and how to do it. So if we are placing those caps on top of one another, it's helpful to put in them so that the child doesn't have to um, work very hard to find them. If we are uh, um, rolling something um, back and forth, it is helpful to put some objects in front of the child and, and, and being ready, showing them that you're ready. And also create a clear understanding of when the activity starts and when it ends, uh, so that the play activity is not chaos, uh, but there is a clear beginning a clear theme, this is what we're doing, and a clear end. Um, and children are more likely to engage for a longer duration of time and to have an experience that is less chaotic and more soothing if they know when it starts and when it ends. One way to make it clear when it ends is to put away toys together, you know, clean up, clean up, everybody, everywhere, we're doing it together, uh, or to say, okay, I'll finish, and to show the next activity. Now, being predictable uh, doesn't mean to be inflexible, doesn't mean to be rigid and, and doing the same things over and over. And this is my fifth uh, tip, is to create flexibility by breaking the repetition. So that is about creating small variations in the play activities. Um, and so after you and your child engage in the same play activities for a while, like Ring Around the Rosie, you want to start playing in a way that is a little different from the way you started. Uh, for example, instead of ending with we all fall down, you end with we all jump up. You do something that is like surprising, breaking the rule a little bit. Why is that important? First, because it makes the play activity more flexible. It gets children used to the idea that things are not always the same. Second, because it teaches children that changes are fun, that you're changing something and it's, it makes it less boring, more interesting, less repetitive. And this is how you can teach new things, is by creating variations. Now that the child has learned how to draw a square, you can teach them how to draw a circle. If the child has learned that when we are drawing, we are going to do something slightly different uh, every time. So I know this looks very theoretical, so I wanna make sure to, to show you how this works with, uh, with a simple um, video. Uh, this, is a, this is a young child who was diagnosed with autism at 20 months and I've been working with this child for a while. Um, I'm going to show you the video first and then I'm going to break it down into those five strategies that I, that I mentioned uh, before. Four. Ready. Ready. Set, go! Yay! Ready, 
Headset. <gasps> Ready? So what is happening here is um, this is on the surface is a very simple play interaction, but this is a child who was not um, not really engaging with people at all when we started working together. And in fact, the only thing that she was doing, the only thing she was interested in was spinning objects. And this is why when I started working with her and I started uh, talking with her mother, um, I, told, I told her mother, look, I think our entry, our starting point here is to spin objects. Um, the reason is, again, because I wanted to do something that was meaningful to the child, known to the child, something that uh, the child could relate to. Uh, and second, I wanted to do it in a way that was not interfering with her goal. So here the child is spinning. This is the starting point. Uh, four. Ready, ready, set, go. I'm doing the same. Notice that here she's not paying attention to me quite yet. So what I'm doing is to, using my first strategy that I, that I mentioned to you, is to take center stage to make sure that I add something fun that the, the child is, um, is going to experience what I'm doing as um, something that is more interesting than whatever was happening when she was doing that by herself. And this is why I am not taking the objects from her. I'm allowing her to do this and I'm trying to win the competition between, you know, with these objects. I'm trying to get her attention by spinning objects and adding sound effects uh, and moving very close to her. Now she looks at the objects. Now she's looking at me. Because Yay! I'm close to her and I'm doing something, um, something playful, something that makes the activity uh, very playful. And then I'm repeating, um, I am repeating the action uh, multiple times. And what I'm doing is uh, my second strategy is to pause and wait for the child to do something in order to continue. <gasps> Yay! Yay! Ready, set. <gasps> you see it here, I did that pause in order for the child to have her role to have uh, to do something in order to communicate to me that she wanted to continue the game. And this is what she does. Yes. Eye contact, imitation, uh, and sharing of affect. This is what I wanted to, this is, this is what I wanted to see. Now we're doing this together because we are, uh, because she communicated to me that she wanted to continue the game. And now we're doing something together and we are, taking turns, that was my third tip. Uh, I'm doing brrr, she's doing brrr, uh, and then we will both uh, spin the object. I'm also creating a very predictable structure. That was my fourth tip, because all of this sequence starts with me saying, ready, set, go, and then I am spinning the object, ready, set, go, and then I'm spinning the object, ready, set, go, and then I pose, and then we are spinning the object but I'm also introducing this uh, little variation, which is my sound. Ready, ready, set, go. So this is going to be the first few times, and then I'm going to change it into something else. Uh, and ultimately into words that I want her to imitate, like spin, 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 or ready, set, go, or one, two, three, something like that, from imitation of mouth movements to using um, actual words in order to uh, communicate with me. So all of these um, strategies, uh, they are really 
designed to get children to learn from playful um, experiences. Um, we studied the use of these strategies in, in different contexts, uh, including one-to-one um, -one, uh, programs, but also group programs where we have kids playing with one another. Um, and I just wanted to share with you the outcome for, for this child. Uh, this is the same child you saw before who was um, in, in our program for a couple of years. And she, uh, she um, in, in, in this video, you will see her uh, when, when she was in school for her, her first year of school. And by then, as you will hear, she had a very, very good language skills um, and didn't need uh, any, any help to be in school with, um, with, other, with her peers. Uh, and her cognitive uh, functioning was also in the average range. Ready. Here we're playing with, um, with the same, with the same uh, uh, play activity because that was, I was remembering from her after not having seen her for, uh, for a few years. Really? Show me. Ready? Oh. That's hard. I know, it's a little hard. Are you having fun here? Yeah. That's good. That's good. I heard it was your birthday a few days ago. Is that... Yeah. Yeah? It's my birthday. I got and this time I got this time. I got this time and this time and this time. Okay. Shall we do another one of this? Yep. Who does it? Me or you? Me. <laughs> okay. So um, the, the volume is a little low, but she told me in a very idiosyncratic way uh, that she had six birthdays. My birthday was this time, this time, this time, this time, this time, and this time. She was counting the, the number of, of uh, birthdays. So the content of her communication is a little unusual, but unusual in a way that I wouldn't necessarily want to change. She still uh, has... Um, what we could call the, some of the uh, idiosyncrasies or, or, or quirks that, that come with having a diagnosis of autism. Uh, but that does not prevent her from engaging with me, from uh, having friends and learning from, uh, from school. And a lot of the things that she has learned, um, she has learned through play activities, play activities that she was engaged in during her second year of life and third year of life. Um, these are some resources where, uh, these are books, uh, where you can find some of these strategies that I talked about in, uh, in, more, uh, in more details. And this is my email address in case you have questions uh, that, you wanna, that you wanna ask uh, through emails. But at this point, I wanted to see whether any of you had questions or, or, or comments or observations about um, about what I what I presented? Dr. Vivanti, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I you know I have you have an eight month old at home and I have a three year old little boy at home, and um, lots of our families have younger kids. But I feel like even these tools can be used with older children as well. With what you were sharing about you know, imitating, repeating, taking turns, and then breaking the cycle at the end with something that's creating more flexibility. I feel like that can be along the lifespan of the whole child. I mean, teenage years and beyond, not just for our little kids, even though that's initially how we want them to learn. I know we're over time by about five minutes, so I just wanted to give everybody a, a minute now if you have a question for Dr. Vivanti. You can um, raise your hand or unmute yourself or put it in the chat. We will be sending a follow-up email today um, with Dr. Bravanti's email and the, everyone's been asking for a copy of your slideshow, Dr. Bravanti, so we'll include that as well. And you can ask Dr. Bravanti any questions you have. Um, Karen Wright wrote in the chat, Dr. Bravanti, thank you for sharing your wisdom with all of us today. Um, thank you so much. I think everyone um, loved all of this, and this is just a good reminder of things that we can be doing at home with our kids, 
um, during this time of COVID. And now that they're announcing in San Diego that schools will mo most likely be online um, for the fall, um, this is a good refresher course for us as parents and um, teachers and educators um, of how we can be present with our kiddos at home and keep that engagement and keep that learning cycle going and um, keep all the skills growing for our kids. Does anybody have any questions that they have really quickly for Dr. Vivanti or anyone like to share anything? Okay, well, we will definitely put Dr. Vivanti's email in the follow-up. So if you have a question for him specifically, you can ask him. Um, it's an incredible, I know this is like a tiny snapshot of the work that you do at Drexel. And I know that you've touched thousands of kids through your research, but thank you for sharing with us today. Um, those little snippets, we all, I have to say, we all loved those videos and it's a really good reminder for um, how we be present with our own children at home. Thank you, thank you so much, Lisa, for, for your words and, and thank you to, um, to the, the, you know, your ability to connect these experiences that we're having here with a big picture of, of the experience of many, of many people at home with children at different ages. And you're right, playfulness is not a, necessarily about young children. Playfulness mm -hmm. is, is a way to engage in activities at, at any age that helps us uh, remembering things, learning things and feeling more connected. So I absolutely agree with you. Oh, thank you. Well, Rebecca, will you take a quick screenshot of us? And then we'll let you guys go today. Rebecca's just going to take a picture if you want to turn your video on. And if not, that's fine as well. All right, Rebecca. Take it right now. One, two, three. Cheese. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Vivanti from Pennsylvania, Cindy from Pennsylvania, Jeff from the Massachusetts, all of you for joining us today. And we will see you all next week on our next Lunch and Learn. Thank you, Dr. Vivanti. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. See you all soon. Dr. Vivante. Thank you.